I, uh, I would not be doing this if I didn't think that I could do a really good job as President of the United States. I mean, why do it? Why do it if you didn't think you could do it? And why do it if you don't have a resume to actually suggest that you can do this? Uh, I have been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, since I've been 17 years old, I've paid for everything that I've had in my life. When I was a junior in college, I started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque and grew that business to employ over a thousand people. Uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, pipe fitting, architects, engineers. It's amazing uh, what can happen if you show up on time and if you do what you say you'll do for people. It's amazing. Uh, I sold that business in 1999. Nobody lost their job and that business is doing better than ever right now. I'm gonna offer you all some advice. Uh, it's worth exactly what you're paying for it. Uh, and that is, is that whatever it is that you're good at, apply it entrepreneurially. Go into business for yourself. Do what you wanna do for yourself and you'll find the rewards to be a hundredfold. Uh, you'll never regret making that decision. One of the takeaways that I have from being in business is, is hiring and firing people. It's really easy to hire people, and it's really difficult to fire people. But if you can't fire people that don't work out, things don't work out. You end up going bankrupt if you're in the private sector, and in the public sector, it's so easy to not fire people because there's really no accountability um, when it comes to that. Mitt Romney said he loves firing people. Mitt Romney and I have a difference when it comes to that. Nothing is harder than firing people. It's the worst thing in the world, but if you can't do it, things don't work out. And President Obama has never hired anybody, and he's never fired anybody, and that's one of the uh, disconnects in the federal government right now. I'm also an athlete. I've been an athlete my entire life, and I think it's important in this endeavor. I have uh, climbed uh, Mount Everest. I've actually gotten to the top of Mount Everest, but significant to that journey was, was that I broke my leg prior to going to Mount Everest. And that's a story that all of us come in contact with every single day, and that is, is that no matter what we plan in our lives, nothing goes according to plan. Nothing. Count on that as being part of the plan, that there'll be, uh, th th there'll be adversity in everything it is that we do. And when faced with adversity, there's a couple of choices you can make. One is you can lay on the couch and bemoan the fact that you've been victimized, or the other is, hey, here it is. Here's the adversity. It's how I deal with that adversity as to whether or not I'm successful or whether or not it's I had never been involved in politics prior to running for governor of New Mexico. I mean no political experience, none. I went and I introduced myself to the Republican Party two weeks before I announced. John Latuzio, who was the chairman of the Republican Party, he says, wow, I like what you've got to say. I like what you've done. We're an inclusive party. You can, you, can, you can travel the whole state. You can make the case to Republicans that you should be their governor. Um, you know, take part in all the debates and all the discussions. But Gary, you just, man, you need to know that you are naive. You are not going to get elected. It's not possible to come from completely outside of politics and get elected governor in a state that's two to one Democrat. Well, I got elected, and I would like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was, let's just bring a common sense business approach to state government. Best product, best service, lowest price. Less government is better government. Keep government out of the bedroom. Don't be making choices for me that I should be making. I can make those choices. So in that context, serving as governor of New Mexico, 
I end up vetoing, this may be an embellishment, all right? I'm waiting for somebody to prove me wrong. I may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I, I vetoed 750 bills. I had thousands of line item vetoes. I took line item veto to a new art form. <laughs> Only two of the vetoes were overturned, so it made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to government telling me or you what we should or shouldn't do with our own lives, decisions that lie with us. And I can cite, I can tell you all sorts of examples, but I remember getting one bill that was quadrupling the fines for uh, speeding in a construction zone, right? How many, of, how many of us drive through a construction zone and the posted speed limit is 50 miles an hour and it's quadruple fine if you go over 50? Well, at times during the day, if you go through that construction zone at 50 miles an hour, it's reckless driving. At other times, when you go through that same zone, middle of the night, nobody's there, you can be driving 100 miles an hour perfectly safe. That's why I hate speed limits, and that's why I know I'm a libertarian, and I've been a libertarian my entire life, because speed limits really don't make much sense. But, but I put myself in the position of, I don't want a quadruple fine for driving through that area perfectly safe, uh, and not putting anyone in harm's way, I don't want a quadruple fine. So I vetoed that legislation. But that's the kind of a stuff I did all the time. I always wrote a veto message. Three things that have happened over the last year uh, with this presidential cycle. One is, and, and New Mexico is a state that's two to one Democrat. I got reelected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time by saying no to government. Really, in a state that's two to one Democrat, I should have been ridden out on a rail. But I think it just speaks volumes to the fact that people really do appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. So in the last year, one was they did a poll on all of the presidential candidates and the, their favorabilities in their own states. How popular are these people running for president in their own states? There's only one candidate running for president that's viewed favorably in his or her own state, and that is me. Now, here's, here's how this works in New Mexico, is people actually wave at me with all five fingers, not just one. <laughs> And then they did a study of all the presidential candidates and who has, who had the best record when it came to job creation. Well, that was me. And my response to that was the same as it was when I was governor of New Mexico. I did not create one single job as governor of New Mexico. The private sector creates jobs, but I did... I did create an environment of certainty, rules and regulations. I controlled all the agencies because I, I uh, hired the heads of all the agencies. I controlled all the boards and commissions because I appointed them all. In essence, I controlled all rules and regulations, and I want to suggest to you that rules and regulations got better on a daily basis with just a root in common sense. If, if all government is doing is adding time and money to our lives and isn't improving our lives in any way, why have them? I mean, why have them? And, And lastly, and this is something that I'm really proud of, is the ACLU. The ACLU, you, a group dedicated to civil liberties, a group dedicated to the Constitution, a group dedicated to the first ten amendments of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the ACLU came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates when it, when it came to civil liberties. This is important. 24 Liberty Torches was a perfect score. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum had zero Liberty Torches out of 24. 
Newt Gingrich had four Liberty Torches out of 24. Uh, Barack Obama had 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. Ron Paul had 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. Yeah, yeah. And I had 21 Liberty Torches out of 24. So right now, uh, I am on the ballot in 48 states. I'm an official write-in candidate in Michigan. We're on the ballot in Washington, D.C., the only state that wears the uh, onus of, um, uh, well, <laughs> Oklahoma really can wear their cross of shame any way they want. Uh, they have not let a third party run now, I guess, for four cycles, and they should be ashamed uh, of that fact. We should have more choices, not less choices. So, um, there are other third party candidates, but no other third party comes close to 50 ballot access. I believe the Green Party is on the ballot in 30 states, just trying to put this into perspective. So when it comes to comparing me and the other candidates, I'm going to talk about the three candidates that are on the ballot in all 50 states, and that would be myself, Barack Obama, and Mitt Romney. Uh, I am the only candidate that does not want to bomb Iran. We bombed... Stop with the military interventions. Stop with the military interventions. Stop with answering everything. We're shooting first. The largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States after 9-11 was in Iran where over a million citizens showed up in support of the United States and we're going to bomb Iran. Right now, we have economic sanctions against Iran. Inflation in Iran right now is running at 75%. It's a horrible place to be. Do the citizens of Iran blame their government for this? Absolutely not. They blame the United States. So we're making more enemies, and if we bomb Iran, we're going to find ourselves with another 100 million enemies to this country that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Afghanistan. I'm the only candidate that wants to get out of Afghanistan tomorrow and bring the troops home. And what's the root of all evil? The root of all evil are politicians that beat their chests and in the name of, I'm going to save you from drugs, I'm going to save you from the illegal immigrant, I'm going to save you from terrorism, poor health care, elect me, re-elect me. And in that vein, that's why we have tens of thousands of innocent civilians dying in these countries where we militarily intervene. That's the reason why our men and service women are dying overseas. That's the reason why our men and service women are coming back with their limbs blown off. All in this notion of elect me and re-elect me. Stop with the military interventions that have us with hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for those military interventions would otherwise not exist. amount to governing is governing with strict adherence to the United States Constitution. So if we're going to intervene, let's have Congress sign off on that in the first place. And in that vein, I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States that believes that marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right. on par with civil rights of the 60s, that it is a federal issue, that it's not a state's issue. I'm the only candidate running for President of the United States that wants to end the drug war now, legalize marijuana now. Ninety percent of the drug problem is prohibition related, not use related. That is not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that should be the focus. 
It's on the ballot in Colorado in just a couple of days, regulate marijuana like alcohol. I think it's going to pass. I think it's going to be the first of 50 state dominoes that are going to bring about rational drug policy in this country. And Coloradans, Coloradans get it. Six years ago, citizens of Denver voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. They get it. And once that happens, what's the, what, what happens when Colorado does that and everybody, um, everybody in the whole country gets on an airplane to go to Denver for the weekend to chill out? What happens is, is that drug policy changes in other states. Let's stop with the 1.8 million arrests in this country. Let's stop with the fact that we have 2.3 million people behind bars. The majority of category of those behind bars are there on drug-related crime. We have tens of millions of Americans in this country who are convicted felons because of our drug because of our drug laws that otherwise would be tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. How would it have worked out to have had a president or have a president that has no aversion to vetoing legislation? I would have vetoed the Patriot Act. Homeland Security would not exist. What a redundant agency. TSA would be the responsibility, airport security would be the responsibility of the airlines, the airports, the municipalities, states, but not the federal government. And if I'm president of the United States and Congress doesn't want to abolish the TSA, guess what? I appoint the head of TSA. I control the rule. I, I control how TSA would actually function. And I guarantee you, overnight, it would be less intrusive and as safe. I guarantee you that. I would never have signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows for you and I, as U.S. citizens, to be arrested and detained without being charged. Isn't this why we fought wars in this country? I'm the only candidate running for president of the United States that is promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. Where we are going to suffer a monetary collapse as a result of borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend. When we have a debate that goes on a couple of weeks ago between Obama and Romney, and the two of them are arguing about who's going to spend more money on Medicare, that is ridiculous. We need to have a raging debate and discussion in this country on how we cut Medicare spending significantly. It's a program where you and I put $30,000 into it, and we end up getting back a $100,000 benefit. Whatever we put in, we get three times more back than what we put in. It is absolutely unsustainable. And for those that are thinking, well, you can't slash Medicare, look, the alternative is no health care at all. That is a collapsed government. That is a monetary collapse. And if we want to look at an example of a monetary collapse, just look at Russia at the end of the 80s. Let's see, they had been in Afghanistan for 10 years and arguably had been bankrupted over that. Hmm. And then uh, they experienced a monetary collapse. The ruble went from being worth something one day to being worth nothing the next day. We're not immune from the mathematics of borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar. 
So balancing the federal budget means a raging debate and discussion over Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, I think the federal government needs to get out of the health care delivery business completely. <laughs> Block, grant the states a fixed amount of money. Give it up to the states, 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice, and that's exactly what we will have. We'll be drawing new lines of eligibility, but we will have a health care safety net for those over 65 and those that are poor. But if we continue to do what we're doing now, there will be no health care for anybody. This is a house of cards. This is Bernie Madoff with a printing machine. That's what we're doing right now in this country. I am the only candidate advocating eliminating income tax, eliminating corporate tax, abolishing the IRS, and replacing all of that with one federal consumption tax. In this case, I'm embracing the fair tax. If you haven't checked it out, check out fairtax.org. Ends up being cost neutral over a very short amount of time because you're going to bleed federal non-transparent taxes out of all goods and services. It's really the answer when it comes to American exports, making our exports that much more competitive. It's the answer to China. It's the answer to manufacturing jobs flocking back to the United States given a zero corporate tax rate environment. It's the answer to tens of millions of jobs being created here in the United States as opposed to anywhere else. That's the answer. I ran two campaigns for governor where I did not mention my opponent in print, radio, or television, meaning not one single negative ad. I think people are hungry to vote for somebody as opposed to the lesser of two evils. I think... I think people want to hear what the issues are. I think people want to engage in the debate and the discussion that needs to occur on all these issues and that putting our heads in the sand and calling our opponents worse than they are without talking about who they are and what they're all about. Um, man, that's where we're at right now and this has just got to end. I am hoping... I'm hoping to rain on the party. I'm hoping to rain on the two-party system. It's over. So, a few words about Barack Obama. Is there anything that he says that you can disagree with? From my standpoint, not really. He says everything. Right. I mean, it's like, I, th I, I equate it to he's playing his violin and the music, the words that come out are just right on. It's just that the reality doesn't match up with the words at all. It's completely opposite. You know, I, I never believed that he was going to balance the federal budget. I never believed that he was going to rein in federal spending, but I really did think that we were going to stop with our military interventions, that that would find its way out of our foreign policy. Well, he's as militaristic an interventionist as we have ever had uh, in the office. I thought when he started talking about gay rights, marriage equality, that we would definitely be advancing on that issue. But taking a position that, uh, that marriage equality is a state's issue is effectively saying, I'm not going to do anything about it because 42 states have recognized marriage as between a man and a woman. You're not addressing the issue. Uh, and then um, drugs, the, the drug war. Gosh, he said some really terrific things regarding the drug war. One of them was, I promise, he said, that I will not crack down on medical marijuana facilities in states where legislatures or citizens voted to implement these programs. Uh, he's closing down these facilities in California and Colorado in complete uh, 
completely going against uh, what he promised. And then Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney's got to be a smart guy. But uh, Mitt Romney says we need to balance the federal budget, we need to hold Medicare intact, and we need to increase military spending. I dare say that everybody here has finished the second grade, and there's a mathematical equivalency that goes along with finishing the second grade. It doesn't add up. He's supposed to be a smart guy, but that just doesn't add up. And then he talks about, in the second debate, in the second Republican debate, he said it's a no-brainer that we should build a fence across the border. You are listening to somebody here who doesn't have one molecule of brain, that would be me, because that would be the stupidest thing you could possibly do, is to build a fence across the border. Let's make it as easy as possible for someone that wants to come into this country and work to get a work visa. And a work visa would entail a background check and a social security card that applicable taxes would get paid. Now, if we implement the fair tax, taxes won't be an issue at all. Because whether you're legal, illegal, a visitor to the United States, or a US citizen, nobody is gonna be able to avoid paying one federal consumption tax. Would immigrants, would immigrants stand in line if the line was moving to get a work visa? Yes, they would. And we are a country of immigrants. And when it comes to immigrants into the United States, when it comes to Mexican immigrants coming across the border, we are getting the cream of the crop when it comes to workers coming across the border from Mexico. So much of the border and the attitudes toward the border have to do with border violence. Border violence is a prohibition phenomenon. Legalize marijuana and arguably 75% of the border violence with Mexico goes away. Forty thousand deaths south of the border over the last four years. These are disputes that are being played out with guns rather than the courts. Didn't we learn anything when it came to the prohibition of alcohol where disputes were being played out with machine guns in the streets as opposed to the courts? Let's get these issues back in the courts. Right now you all have to be hearing the following and that is you shouldn't waste your vote. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Don't waste your vote on somebody that you don't believe in. Vote for the person you believe in. That's how you change things in this country. I'm asking you all, with the time remaining, Take your neighbors, take your friends, take your co-workers by the collar, shake them up a little bit, and ask them to look at voting for Gary Johnson. That that would not be a wasted vote. That would be a vote that would change things, even if he doesn't end up winning. That would change things in a really positive way. And my pledge to each and every one of you, if you vote for me, nobody, nobody will regret that. One is, I could actually be president. There would be no regrets in that way. The other is, four years from now, let me offer up, let me look into my crystal ball here. And that is, either Obama or Romney are elected, we are going to find ourselves with a heightened police state as opposed to one that should be rolled back or non-existent. We're going to find ourselves continuing to militarily intervene in, this, in, in places we shouldn't be. We're going to find ourselves with more enemies to this country as opposed to less. And we're going to find ourselves continuing to spend money in ways that are absolutely unsustainable with the result being a monetary collapse sooner than later. That is a wasted vote for either one of those two. Thank you very, very much for taking your time to be here.